Welcome to Lab the Podcast. Today is a special episode for us. As many of you know, Lab stands for Life and Beauty. And our show, Lab the Podcast, as well as the Wayfair Podcast, they're a part of V3 Ministries. And our overall work is to share the life and beauty of the gospel with the world. We get to do that in this show by highlighting people whose lives and work give us a glimpse of that life and beauty of the gospel. And back in 2019, we launched the Lab Initiative in order to help not just talk about these ideas, but to embody them and to see a little bit of that life and beauty appear in our local area and around the world and to contribute financial resource to that end. And so today we get to talk about the Lab Initiative and our team started out with the idea of the Lab Initiative saying if there was a place or a seam, a tear in things where we wanted to see that life and beauty appear again, where would it be? And 100% of our team said the area of human trafficking and human slavery. If there's a place that we want to see life and beauty appear, that's where it is. And so back in 2019, we got together and said we're going to create this Lab Initiative And it's going to be an effort to bring friends together and resource together and direct it to that end, to seeing life and beauty appear in a really dark space. And since then, we've provided over $50,000 for education and enforcement and survivor care efforts, both locally, internationally, and we're just beginning. So as we prepare for 2024, which starts in January with National Human Trafficking Awareness Month, which is just around the corner, if you can believe that, We're taking steps to strengthen and to scale the lab initiative. And today, that effort involves our two guests. So I'm here with two incredible guests. One is Christina Cruzy, who's joining our V3 team as our new lab director. So Christina, welcome to the team. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so good to have you. And another member is, our other guest is a, is the board member for an organization called the Oak Rock Foundation. And for security purposes, and I'll get into this a little bit later, but we're going to keep that board member's name anonymous and identity anon- uh, anonymous. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more, but welcome so much. Thank you for your work and what you're contributing to this work. Glad to be here. This is fun. Thanks, Zach, for having me. And Christina, good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, it's good to get us all three together. We've been talking about this for months, and so it's good to have this uh, space created where we can do it and doing it over Zoom. So, no, it really is. This is fun, and it's good to be for friends. That's that's always fun on our end. We say that so many times that if it starts with friendship, we're going to end up in a good place. So that's how this conversation started, and I'm I'm excited to pull on the thread a little bit. Our dream. For 2024, like I said, is to take this little seed of an idea to create a lab initiative, a life and beauty initiative, and to say, what would happen if we just started to like start with friendship, link up with people all across the country, all across the world with a common aim? And we saw this with William Wilberforce and the Clapham sect, and there's so many good operations and works going on for uh, to fight human trafficking and to rescue survivors and to provide aftercare. And we just want to contribute to that work. We want to help. And our small piece is to see if we can be a catalyst to raise funds and to direct those funds to partners who are doing incredible work. So, Christina, part of that work is going to be uh, your job as our lab initiative director to help us scale this initiative. So we'll get into that work, but particularly why, what, What prompted you to give your yes? You're super talented, you're super bright, and could do a million things and good things. Why'd you say yes to this particular project? So the lab initiative is really the whole reason that we met. Um, Thin thread in social media, I saw that there was a live taping for a podcast. I had been listening to podcasts for several years, but never gone to a live taping and was like, let's check this out. So showed up and met you and had a wonderful experience. So fast forward, I think two years later, it's come full circle. And it's just when God puts those little seeds out there and things start to connect. And then you know that it's not just a, um, a mistake or an accident like things were really lined up and now we're here and things have come full circle and be able to give back to um, an organization and to you that you guys have given us so much so really happy to be here and to help in any way that I can yeah it's awesome we're so grateful for 
just extraordinary people who are willing to say yes, like I'll volunteer to step in and bring what I have and help. And so thank you for doing it. We couldn't scale this initiative. Uh, we've been able to do what we can uh, up to this point, but we're really hoping in 2024 that it grows. And that's going to be a part of your work so that we can be a strong partner for Oak Rock. So I want to turn your direction and just maybe give us a little bit of background for Oak Rock Foundation and the work that you're doing. And that's a costly thing to give your yes. So I'm curious why you leaned into this work as well. So go ahead and take it away. Well, what, what began in 2015 was us just simply underwriting, help underwrite a, a, a rescue, a sting operation. And after doing it, uh, we decided, let's look and see how else we can help. And from there, uh, some of our, our, our team had some, I guess you would say, uh, special talents that they were, they were interested in. And we ended up being involved in, in several rescues ourselves. And, and people have asked, why did we continue down this road? Uh, very simple. Once you've seen the darkness and the evil that this really is, you really can't get away from it. I mean, you can't unsee what you've seen. It's the darkest of all dark darkness. I, I, I can't talk about how evil this evil really is. And so our heart was just, we've got to go do something. And it began there very simply and grew, not trying to, uh, we weren't trying to set any records. That's for sure. We didn't even want to be in this space, but we just knew, okay, we've got the ability to do some things that, that can make a difference in a lot of, a lot of lives, especially a lot of young lives. Our real focus is the children that are being affected in this. And so uh, it was just one of these things that you just, you can't, you can't walk away from, I, or we can't, I'll just put it like that. We can't walk away from it. And we wanted to be able to just go battle in the, and in the, in the, in, get on the front line. We wanted to be in the battle. That's where we wanted to be. And uh, I think that's what, that's what separated us. Yeah. It's, I have such admiration for you and for your teams. And we get to talk to incredible people who are doing enforcement work, education work, survivor care work. Uh, and it's, it's difficult. But the common thread that I have heard is exactly that. Every single person working in that space, no matter what part of the work they're engaged in, when they respond to that question, they say the same thing. I can't, I can't go back. Once I meet a person who's been impacted in this way and dehumanized in a way and taken advantage of or, or uh, enslaved, I can't go back to my normal everyday routine without some sort of a change taking place. And for you, extraordinary, right? Like to step in and say, okay, all, my yes might look different from somebody listening to this podcast, but there's going to be ways that all of us can give a yes to this. And that's really my hope catalytically is to say it takes all of us. It takes survivor care organizations and enforcement organizations. It takes Oak Rock Foundation stepping out and doing the work they're doing. And Christina, it takes little old lab initiatives to try to create resource and to bring resource together and to direct it to places where it can be really effective. Maybe give us a little, uh, just high level understanding of our hope for the lab initiative. And we want to create sustainable funding. How do we do that? What are the ways that the lab initiative brings funding together so that we can direct it to places like Oak Rock? Sure. So I would say the first one is really just private individuals, you know, take a look at your giving, you know, where are you putting your dollars? And if you don't have the time to vet and research all those organizations, you know, these are great opportunities to be able to, um, those who follow you to find out, you know, what organizations should I put my dollars to? And so I think that's a great first place to start is what can we do as an individual? How can we tithe? How can we be a good steward of our money and put those into fruitful foundations? Another one is simply by, um, you know, who else maybe do we know? Do you work for a corporation that maybe can do matching gifts? Do you, um, you know, who in your circle are you aware of that would love to be a part of this? Because it takes more than just one person. It takes all of us working together to be able to, um, overcome the issues in the world with human trafficking. And then really the third piece of that that we're going to touch on is also, you know, being a better steward of what our consumption. So we have a partnership with Buddy Brew and the lab initiative and $3 of every bag of coffee, the, the specific freedom roasts that you all developed, uh, three bags or $3 per bag is going to go to the lab initiative. And then that all that money in 2024 is going to go to uh, the Oak Rock Foundation and the, their fight in human trafficking. So just by switching one of your monthly 
consumable habits of drinking coffee, you can really make a difference. And maybe it's $3, but $3 times 10,000 households, and we have $30,000, you know, coming in every single month that we can do a lot of really good stuff with. So, and the coffee's great. Um, it's awesome that Buddy Brew is willing to do that. Um, and it's wonderful that we have consumable products that want to be able to give back. And kind of it's that, um, that mindset of doing what we're already going to do. I think Buddy Brew, it's brew good, do good. And, you know, it's just that simple. You get up every morning and pour yourself a cup of coffee and know that what you're doing is going to affect people's lives. Yeah. It's so cool to think that we can make a difference like that. And when we work together, p- particularly, that some really extraordinary things can happen. We're going to pull on that thread. But most likely you're listening to this episode on a run or you're driving to work or you're in your kitchen or, you know, all the places that we consume content like this. And here's what's cool. You're out doing your run or you're driving or you're going about your daily routine. Buddy Brew is roasting coffee. And Dave and Susan over at Buddy Brew made one choice to say to bring our team in and say, hey, let's create a roast, Freedom Roast, and set aside $3 of every sale that takes place and direct that right to the lab initiative. And so, like you said, with one consumer choice, what Dave and Susan have put us in a position to do, think about that, 100,000 people decide to buy coffee, we have $300,000 that we can direct directly to impact this. That's extraordinary. So just think, this is where I get excited of what's possible if we just work together and, and take one step. This, the other side of that then is having the right partnerships with people who go do the work on the ground. And part of the reason that we're, we're protecting the identity of our board member and partner from Oak Rock is that the particular work you're doing on the ground is, is right there where light is entering darkness. And so to protect your family and your team and the work you're doing, we're taking those steps to um, even particularly right now, you've been in some operations that have been really, um, really important and disruptive to that darkness. And so we're taking those steps, but it, it requires all of us who are buying coffee and then people on the other side who are around the world doing that really hard work. I'm wondering, can you tell us a little bit about the particular work of Oak Rock? Because you are operating here in the States but also in 50 countries around the world. Give us a little bit more detail on the particular work because we talk about survivor care, aftercare, enforcement, and you all are doing a little bit of everything. So help give us a little bit better view of Oak Rock. Yeah, and, and you know, Zach, it, what, we didn't start out to do a little bit of everything. It just kind of, you know, it, one thing moved to another is what happened. And so today, if, when you look at kind of the, the footprint, basically, uh, our footprint is this number one we rescue that's normal that's pretty much what a lot of groups do um uh we rescue and when we when we talk about a rescue a lot of people don't understand they're they're, they they come in well three different kind of modes of rescue number one for us would be a sting operation sting operation is where we would uh spend a lot of time actually with the bad guy developing relationships uh, we, we have a sting, uh, a, a story that's set and told, and then we have to have the girls and, in a particular setting, and they are brought in by the bad guy. Uh, the, the local authorities, we work with them in every case. They come in, arrest everybody, including our team. I mean, they throw our team on the floor and handcuff them and throw them in a paddy wagon. And I guess the big risk in that part, if, if somebody's on a take, well, you are in a paddy wagon and you are in handcuffs but at any rate they're supposed to take us to the airport and that's what they've always done get us out of the country uh but that's a sting operation that is set up as a sting the girls are then taken to our aftercare facilities and all that the bad guys are taken to jail a raid would be another one a raid would be a setting that in some countries it would look like what uh, uh typically all of us would consider a bar that's what it would look like if we went inside it uh however if we went out the back of it it would be a big open area with huts. It's where they keep the girls that they've trafficked. Uh, that's where all the operation of that is going on. And so a raid is literally a raid. It is a raid with everybody on the floor. It's a raid with going in and grabbing the girls. They think they're being arrested, so they're fighting. But they go into a paddy wagon and take into our safety. Uh, the bad guys take into prison, that type thing. And so that's what a raid would look like. And then Obviously, we have uh, a lot that we do domestically. Uh, we we uh, do through uh, basically our forensic lab. And, and that would be our ability to go behind the scenes in the dark 
side of the web, the behind the dark side of the web. And, and, and we can do things in that world that can't be done anywhere else. In fact, we just, uh, an example of that, uh, we had a grandmother who was babysitting two infant twins. Uh, it was a snatch and run situation. Uh, she made a call that, that the sheriff knew. Obviously, they know how to reach us in our, our facility, what we can do. Um, and we explain it. When, when you have infants that are taken, one of two things are going on. Number one, if it, it, it's a satanic group, cult group, they are going to sacrifice those children, drink the blood, do all their ritual. That's what's going to go on. We don't like to think that happens in America, but it's happening probably as we speak. Um, the second side of that, though, is the money side, and that is um, organ harvesting. And so uh, we knew that if it was a, a cult group, we couldn't, nobody's going to get to those two little babies fast enough. However, if it's, if it's organ harvesting, we've got a shot. And we did. It was a five-hour process of, of negotiating with the bad guys. And while they were being surrounded, the rest was, went on. The, the little babies were rescued and, and they were all arrested. And, and, and we were able to do something that, uh, a rescue in that case that very few people have the capabilities to do. So that's when we say rescue, that's the depth of it. Then secondly, we arrest. Now, this is a separator. We have a lot of good friends in this space that do what we call soft rescue. So soft rescue would be one of these organizations and it could be the three of us and it could be Cami with you too. Uh, 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 and we would be in a hotel uh, with their organization. We would call a girl up off the streets. And when she got to the room, we would explain we're here with this ministry and we're here to get you out. That's a safe, a soft rescue. And, and we applaud that. They have rescued somebody from that setting. Our side is we want to cut the snake's head off. I'm just being honest with you. We are going after the snake because he's going to go steal somebody else the next day. All right. They're going to OD these girls anyway with drugs. So it's not a big loss to them. We want this bad guy. We are after the bad guy. We do the arrest. Then we also do the case development for that arrest. In other words, when, when we do an arrest, we turn everything over to the attorney general. We turn it in, in, in a country or a mag, magistrate or to, you know, local authorities, uh, DA, any of that type stuff. All the legwork is done. Everything is done that needs to be done. And it's there to put the bad guy away. That's the key. So we want to make sure that they are prosecuted and they are found guilty. That is crucial to what we do. Fourthly, we facilitate aftercare. We have transition teams set in every setting we do. That's priority. Why? It's where we minister. It's where we minister to the children, where we minister to the young ladies, the young kids, the young guys. Uh, all of that is done in that setting. Okay. Um, and, and that can look different in different ways. We can't wrap our kind of our American mindset around this, but a lot of the children rescued were actually sold into slavery by a mom. And we can't even comprehend that here, but that's what's going on. So those obviously are not going back to mom. We've got that taken care of. But at any rate, uh, this transition team, this, there's a lot that goes into this that people don't even understand. When you do a rescue and you got a picture, you rescue, say there's 73 young ladies that you're taking. Uh, you take them and grab every luggage, whatever they've got at their place. They've been kept all this time and you get them to our facility, our aftercare facility, which we've already set up They're They're on drugs. They're high. Okay. We have to do uh, immediately. We have to do a pregnancy tests, tests for STDs, uh, organ harvesting. Have any of them gone through that, which many have uh, you see, I start detoxing for the drugs. You, there, there's a, a myriad of things that go on that people don't comprehend. They don't know all that's happening. And that's, that's another side of what we do ministry wise. That is huge. Um, then we're involved in what they call in the industry, the matrix It's really government networks is what it really comes down to. Um, and these are real crucial for us. These are relationships with heads of government that we have. And these heads of government are the one that actually connect with us and say, can you come help? Um, uh, and, and, and we're what's known as an NGA, a Joe NGO, a non-government organization. So we go around, we're not a government, we're a humanitarian organization. We go around any of the regulations and we go straight to help them. Um, and this has really paid off in some other endeavors we do where we've needed safe havens and we've had these relationships 
And since they're humanitarian relationships, they've been very open to us helping with that. Then we train. This is a, this is a, a, a unique area that we saw is necessary. I'm very big on we can't save the world. <laughs> We've got to leave ourselves there where people can do what we can do. That's crucial. So especially when you're an international, but people don't think you even need to do that here with sheriff departments and things like that. Absolutely we do. And we have to train in everything from SWAT to hostage recovery to everything that is involved in this arena. But you've got to understand uh, they don't know how to do what we can do and they've got to be taught. It's so fun. And one one area of the world, we trained a couple of teams. They actually arrested really the largest trafficker in that whole area. It was a madam that surprised us. We weren't expecting that in that setting, um, but they did it. And it was just so exciting to know this is why we train. This is what we want. You guys can go do that. It's awesome. But lastly for us, and what really separates us is our cyber intel capabilities. Um, there are a lot of groups out there that have support for, for our local law enforcement. Uh, they, they have software that can help them and help them rescue people and, and find people and those type things. Those guys are incredible. We have all that capability with all your, um, you, your software people in here. We, we can go where you want to go. Cellbrite, gray key, you know, uh, magnet axiom, TOO. So, I mean, we could go through Cl Clearview AI. I'll, we got all, all that that gives us the ability to, to really do phone extractions and we can do data analysis. We can do those things. Yes, we can do all those things. We sit on the task force for uh, ICAC, Internet Crimes Against Children. And our focus here is to go get the pedophile, period, case closed. We're going after them. And <laughs> we not only give the support to local authorities, and you got to understand, the local authorities, the law enforcement of this country, in this arena, they're overworked, they're, over, they're, they're underfunded, and they're undertrained. And what we can do is we come up beside them. I'll give you one state, for instance. It had, it had last year 18,000 cases with 250 agents. That was it. And those agents had to do all the other things they were in charge of. This year, we're in November, they already have 27,000 cases and the same amount of agents. So what we do is we step in and take a load off that. We have 110 cases operating right now that we're involved in, but we put the task force, our task force specifically, uh, it's designed for this arena. We don't, we don't investigate any other cases. We are focused on one thing, one thing, and that's internet crimes against children, period, case closed. And these internet crimes against children, this is hard for America to wrap their heads around because these are people that live next door that are doing these crimes. These, this is not this, the, 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 the bad guy, the criminal you're thinking about. No, this is a grandfather. I'll give you the case. Deacon in a church, very, very respected in the, in the community he's in. He had a, a uh, step-grandchild, 11-year-old in another state, had a local grant, biological grandchild in the local setting he was in, a 12-year-old. So he's got 11 and a 12. The 11-year-old he bought a cell phone for as a gift. He began posing as a 14-year-old. And after a year, a year and a half, he had her uh, uh, making pictures, doing pictures and, and posing and things like that for this, what she thought was 14-year-old guy that really liked her. He began to act that out on the local grandchild. And so now you have him acting it out and doing video of that. Well, we could undercover, we undercover all that type stuff. And that's what's going on. When I talk about 18,000 cases in just a state, 27,000 in just a state, that is what's going on in America. It is absolutely mind blowing what's going on and who's doing it. That's, that's the scenario. I had a situation just a lot like this that a pastor wanted me to meet with a uh, a man that he was friends with from his congregation that was a large donor for for uh, those that were involved in in rescues and things like that and the day we were supposed to meet he called and said we can't meet he got arrested last night for running a prostitution ring so the bad guy will do things to give a cover while he operates 
in these bad things. So that's where we are with this. The, these seven things we do, in other words, it's very broad based. That's what goes on. So when you talk about what we do, it's, it's, it, it, it gets in a lot of hands is what goes on. It's, it's, it's a big operation is what it's become. Yeah. I'm sitting here, Christina, I'm sure you're feeling the same way. Like a, your heart sinks, you know, you hear that one, just one story and you, then you think 18,000 and quickly 27,050 countries. The, the challenge is what happens to me. I get overwhelmed very quickly and I'll just be honest. I feel this sense of a being overwhelmed, B being really cynical and I'm just being honest, I think a lot of people feel that cynicism because of what you just described. Even the people who are helping, so many times we hear stories of exactly what you just described. Like we had high hopes that something really good was happening, but then right underneath it, something tragic becomes unveiled. And so I think a lot of people are A, just overwhelmed at the scope and scale of the problem, B, they are feeling a little bit uncertain of, well, how do we know how to help? How do we know who to trust? And, you know, there's a great book, The Speed of Trust, and some of it is that you have to take a step and there is risk and there is vulnerability there. But give us just a sense of some of the ways that you, as an organization, make sure that the, the people that you're working with, the partnerships that you're building, the teams that you're deploying, how do you maintain the integrity of the work. And again, nobody's perfect. Nothing's perfect. And, but I think speak to that if you can just a little bit, because again, I'm reeling here from the scope and scale of the issue and we'll pull on that thread in a second, but just from the integrity side of the work for that person who's going, I hear you, but I've heard this story before and I've been really disappointed and really hurt actually by the people that are trying to help and it's getting uh, harder and harder to trust. How do you build back that trust? Well, and, and we agree with you that there's a lot of a lot of things that have gone on in this area, and it's sad. And I think the biggest thing we try to do is ours is all done relational. You know, we don't uh, we we have relationships with friends like you. Friend, ours is private relationships, and so we do a couple of things. Uh, Oak Rock was set up so that 100 percent goes of everything goes to the boots on the ground there's no overhead there's no staff there's none of that we wanted it was some men that came together and said we want to we want to be the arena that they can look at and know there it goes and we can make sure we're involved at a very high level with every place it goes we can watch everything that goes we can give reports every month of where everything is what's going on we hold all of our teams to high, high standards. Now, I'm not saying that some of them can't make mistakes. That I, I, you, you pray that that's not going to happen. We've got some godly men running some. I mean, this thing it has really been special to see what's happened. But they all are very open to accountability. They want that. They want to walk in that realm so that we can go. Here's where we're at. Here's what's going on. Now, obviously, some things you can't share because of risking security purposes. But we can do enough that people know, hey, that's that's we know what's going on. We know we know exactly what's happening. So we're very sensitive to that. We wanted to create an, a, an arena that could be trusted and we could take people to it. They could go, look, you know, here, here's what's going on. Here's 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 the forensic lab. You want to walk in it with us? You want to see what goes on? You want to meet the people? Let's go. Come on. You want to, uh, you know, whatever, how how. Uh, how bold are you? You want to do a sting? Well, that's your choice. You know, uh, we, we can, we can put you in some settings that are pretty interesting, but at any rate, uh, we want to make sure that everything is that th th this is too big of an arena for us not to make sure that it's done right. That people are, you know, that, that these kids are, are rescued, that not only rescued, but restored. And, and I'll say this about children. They're pretty resilient. I have been amazed at, at stories that we have, we have to see how resilient some of these children are. Now, a lot of it, you know, you know, and we all know what God does, just miracles that he does in their lives. But um, it's to see that transformation. And so we're going to walk in this, uh, you know, and, and, and be as 
transparent. We're big on transparency anyway. As you know, you've seen very much transparency. Christina's seen a whole lot of transparency from us. Some people go, we don't need to see any more of that transparency. That's enough, you know, but no, that's what it's about. I mean, we, we need people to know this is how, how it operates. And here's why. So many people, Zach, are saying um, it can't be that bad. It's not really that bad. It's not really yeah. going on. When I got to tell you, it's worse than what you think. It's absolutely worse than what you think. And it is next door and it is in your city. And, and, and I don't, you know, no matter where you are, it's going on. These internet crimes against children in this country are out of control, out of control. And these children are being damaged forever, forever. And all this rescue stuff, when I say children that we're working on, I'm talking about children four, five, six, and seven years old. And people say, what in the world would you, you don't understand. The number one money maker is child pornography. These little girls, these little boys are being raped 10 times, 15 times a day for video. That's what's going on. And that's a wake up call. And when you start seeing these little children, it is just, that's something you can't walk away from. And that's why our fight is we're going to take down the bad guy. Period, case closed. We're going to get the bad guy. We're going to stop. We're going to rescue the kids, but we're going to get the bad guy. That's what we're doing. We were in one of our first ops, and I got, uh, we, we, uh, it ended up being the, the, the largest rescue at the time. But, but um, on a Thursday before the, before the sting went down on Saturday, I got a message from our lead, and he said, uh, we just found out this guy has 32, 32 little girls between the ages of four and seven four and eight right in there. And the text just said, we're going to get them. Now in my mind, I thought, Oh no, they're going to kick a door in. And this is going to get really ugly fast. That wasn't what he was doing. They were just going to make sure we're not leaving without them. I said, no, we're, we're, we're going to make sure we have them. People can't even comprehend that kind of darkness and evil, but that's what's going on. So, um, yeah, there's too much at stake. There's too much. At, here, here's my mindset, Zach. There's too much at stake here for people to do it wrong. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I, I want that kind of transparency. And I think all of us do want to see partners raise up and say, A, we're going to lean into this. We're not going to back down, even though there have been organizations that have been, mistakes have been made, things have been tough. It's a frictiony place to get into, but that doesn't mean we back away. Nope. Christina, I'm curious from your side, are you sitting here with the feeling that I think so many people are having, you know, because and I, I want to, again, give voice to this because you just hit on it. We, It feels unbelievable. Like, I can't believe that. And I think that's part of the fog and the fight that we have to cut through is that part of us that just kind of turns it off. And then you'll hear about it. Like in Georgia, you know, 43 kids will be rescued or there will be 120 arrests. And it'll just kind of happen. It'll shock you and you'll see it. But then it goes away. Is it hard for you to believe? Do you struggle with that? Like, oh, like, how do I get my mind around it? Yeah, it's definitely very overwhelming. And I think what I find the most frustrating as I learn more about this is that the U.S. is the largest consumer of it. So it's really if we just stopped consuming, you know, then the problem goes away. So it's like, how do you encourage people to not? And I think it starts with really the faith walk and having a good armor on and just not being able to be tempted into um, the dark side, essentially, because if the consumption stops, then all these, all these other situations stop. So it's really understanding, you know, what's the difference between good and evil and really walking that out. And I think that's been so great. What the lab has been able to provide is that faith-based and what Oak Rock is doing with children, you know, that are susceptible or not susceptible, just giving them that godly foundation so that they do know the difference and really being able to start people from an early age of like knowing the difference between right and wrong. And I think that's part of the conversation in society we need to have that there is a, there really is a right and there really is a wrong. And this is definitely wrong, but we have to take ownership of it and take on that. Like we are the problem, like the U S is the biggest consumer. So you, you have to start with the source and we are what unfortunately the world is catering to when it comes to human trafficking. Yeah. It's so thank you for bringing it back to that place because I think too, in people's minds, they're saying it's a demand reduction issue. If we can stop the demand, 
then these the supply dries up. And if we don't talk about that, and so I, I want to say yes, like that's part of, and it's and it's even deeper. That's part of the work of Lab the podcast is to uncover an enchanted view of what it is to be a human. That your body matters, and sex is a beautiful thing, and it's God given. And there's a way to recover back what's been completely distorted and twisted and perverted. And America, unfortunately, in our disenchantment and just complete like the moral decline, we can't even call evil, evil. And so I, I appreciate that. And I want to put a pin in what you said, that there's like a theological conversation to have. There's that, that has a moral component and a good and a true part of it. There is a demand reduction side of it. That is, is a part of this conversation, 100%. And then there are partners like Oak Rock that are a part of the actual direct action. And there's three different Theaters, I think, is the word that you use to talk about the specific work. So, again, as as you listen to this next part about those three theaters, keep in mind it's a yes, right? There, we we need the gospel to penetrate hearts and to transform minds and renew people to see who they were made to be. Yes, that's the highest and best first work. A part of that is a recovery of a view of sexuality and human personhood in our bodies. That's a yes. There's a demand reduction side. That's a yes. And then there's these theaters that need specific direct action. Go into those a little bit more and give us some light yeah. around the specific work. Well, Zach, this is a separator for us. I think just the, our ability to move in three theaters uh, and, and, and it kind of gives the scope of what all we do. Now, you'll see these, these seven things that we do intertwined in these but first obviously is our counterhuman trafficking that that's first the 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 rescues and all that that we've talked about the arrest um and and that's both domestically internationally it's it it encompasses all of them that's your stings that's your you know that's your raids that's your forensic lab stuff and all that we do there with the internet crimes against children in fact we uh we just were in a major major uh arrest that we did 19 a, a sting and it it, it was a, a a big group a major group in the south 19 uh that were running that group and had been doing it for multiple years uh this involved many many agencies large agencies our agreement with those agencies was that we would be remain stealth as we provided the the, the back end and the actual in the foxhole with them doing the arrest um and they agreed to that and obviously uh, that's how we operate, but that that was that's was a big sting operation that went on. So when we talk about counter human trafficking, uh, that's in a lot of locations. There, we are in boots on the ground as we're talking right now, or in 19 countries right now. And when you say boots on the ground, it could be six to nine months there, putting everything. Because why? Well, remember, we're doing the case development. We're doing everything there, so we need to know how many girls, where are they? All this whole, it's a major operation. So counter human trafficking and, and people are aware of that. Our second theater though, is what we refer to as crisis and conflict. That would be a country like the Ukraine, for instance, is one, but there are multiple ones in this country, in this world right now. What happens there is you have what are known as IDPs, internally displaced people, persons, okay? Um, these are people that are stuck in conflict zones. Let me give you an example of Ukraine. Think, put yourself in that position. The young men are drafted into the military. So what are they left behind? A young wife, many, a young wife and young kids. That's the setting, which then opened them up to a lot of vulnerability. Number one, their homes were destroyed. They were just in the streets. They were open to the gangs. The gangs began to come in and, and, and just really kidnap. They would take the little children and there, there's your, your child pornography directive moving the ladies they were selling into countries. Uh, for trafficking, the young moms, the young married. Uh, it was a nightmare. Now, we were already boots on the ground in the Ukraine when all of this went down anyway. So we were watching this operation going, this is a different type of rescue, but we've got to get involved at a high level. And so we began to move these moms, these young married and children, these children across the Ukraine to safety. Now, back to that matrix of governments. All of a sudden now we had the ability to go, can you help us? Can we get, can you give us safe harbor? And, and that's what began to happen. We moved uh, 45,000 of these children and their moms last year. One point we moved 25,000. 
Now, as we walk, we walk, ride little bikes and all this across a country, okay? We do what we call, uh, it's what we call our Hope Restored Celebrations. Over here, we would call it Vacation Bible School. That's what we would really call this. But we've got these children, and, we're, and we, have, we have them every day. We go through um, uh, our stories, and, and we build it around a theme of superheroes. That's what we do. That, and we talk about their superhero and all that. And then we introduce the superhero for them, for Ukraine, is the real hero, and it's Jesus. And we tell his stories, and we begin to minister to them. We use art therapy pet therapy now we brought in not just the dogs but this last two weeks ago we started bringing in some dog some horses in some different areas when they get to those areas for the children as we move them across and then across the border into safety we have a complete database that we operate we register everybody we move so that their husbands can find them and they know how to reconnect and so it's an if you put that in perspective uh if you if you think of food clothing uh we had to have a, a an extra box truck a couple of months ago i mean things that people don't even think about to what that operation really looks like all right that's one country as we're speaking right now we're doing this in 31 countries now obviously some people know in some areas that there are some internally displaced people yes and and yes we're there um but that is a major rescue though they aren't captured yet does that make sense Zach? that they haven't been taken yet it's before they get taken it's to it's to keep them from get, being taken they are vulnerable they have nobody to help them in that setting and so we've done it we've actually recruited pastors that weren't drafted and uh if you saw them now they're armed in bulletproof vests and they can they can fire arms pretty well right now we've trained you know we train and that's what we do and we move in groups. It's 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 a, an incredible operation. So uh, that's our second theater. So we're rescuing. Now we're moving crisis and conflict, uh, and and doing our hope restored uh, celebrations because that's where we really get to share the gospel. That's so fun to watch what's going on there. And, and you know, you, we start this year. We moved twenty seven hundred and some in January, twenty three hundred in February. Last month we moved nine hundred eighty two. It, it it varies. That's that's what's going on. It's constant. Now, the third one is what we call recovery and extraction. Uh, we were in, uh, we had boots on the ground in Afghanistan when that happened. We knew that we would not get out of it. I knew my team would not get out of Afghanistan there because our agreement with the government is if anything goes down, they don't know who we are. And that's fine. That's how we operate. We understand that completely and we're good with it. But I knew that they weren't going to get on a plane. We ended up getting some deals cut and got into Uzbekistan. And as soon as they got there, we got report of 2200 believers christians in the underground church that were being executed in their front yards basically all the families so we moved back in immediately and sent more boots to get addresses and to get these people to safety so extraction recovery here that's where we go in to those that are being persecuted for their faith being killed and martyred for their faith rescuing them we just rescued the, 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 the number one biggest known pastor in Afghanistan. Uh, the one that, uh, you know, the Taliban was after the most. Uh, he has a family of 12. His youngest is three years old. And for the last two years, they have lived from cave to cave. They have literally lived in caves. That's the setting. And so we got to them first. They are now safe. They are in a, one of those safe countries, and uh, they were they were rescued. That's another rescue. That's a rescue before or, or you know trying to help before these people get taken. So that kind of puts it in perspective. You go to the counter human trafficking, and that can be anything. A, a, a little twelve year old. Well, she was taken at nine. She's twelve now. When we rescued her at, in Nicaragua, we rescued her in Kurdistan. What people have to understand. What can you imagine? Your little child. They can't speak the language. They don't know where they are. They have no concept. Little boy, you saw some pictures of this little little guy that is so dear to our hearts. He's nine. He was taken when he was six. And when we rescued this little boy, he was chained literally to a chair, and men molested him seven days a week. See, people don't understand this darkness, and they ask me why we keep going, and that's why. And that's the key, that somebody has to go. And somebody has to risk it. And we put ourselves in a position that God's just opened doors. 
that we never knew would open and put us in a place that we can be very, very effective now across this globe. So, you know, 19 countries with that we're doing right now, just the rescues that are going on, 31 countries moving these, uh, uh, you know, crisis and conflict children and their, and their, you know, innocent moms, things like that. Uh, all 50 states we operate in in this country, uh, you know, with what we're doing with our ability to go cyber intel that we can do. And obviously that's working with sheriff's departments, agents, you know, all of those agents and, and being a real blessing, but not just working with, we're in the foxhole with them. We go do the rest. Why? Because we have deputies on our, that we have people that can arrest. We did it and set it up on purpose that way. And it's a model that we can duplicate throughout the entire country. So uh, that's the picture. When you take the steps that we do, but then we have three theaters that we operate in all at the same time we're operating. So you can begin to see that it's a massive undertaking um, and one at a scale that we never even, never even thought we could never comprehend before. So that's where we are. That's extraordinary to think about all three of those operations or theaters being worked at the same time, the scale and scope of those countries. You give those numbers of like 20, just moving 27,000 people. I have four kids and <laughs> to load the minivan and get out the door to the park is, is a challenge. And so it's hard. I think this is what's so cool about what's happened with the lab initiative since we started in 2019 is we're a tiny little organization. We've got an incredible group of people and an incredible group of partners who are helping us share the life and beauty the gospel with the world and it we've always started with this idea of bring what you have five loaves and two fish and so we started out with uh, a woman here who has a ministry to go into strip clubs and care for women who are working in those clubs bring literature to their kids and and gifts to the kids who are in with those single moms and a lot of those that hurt and that was awesome and that that relationship opened the door for work that was going on locally here to you know do rescues and survivor care it took us to a boys home and I got to tour a boys home and Cammy and I walked through and again had the same feeling the whole time of it's hard to believe this is happening and then you go in and you meet young boys who are being cared for and restored in their lives and you see the incredible work of these workers who are giving all their time and they're in an undisclosed location because they can't make those safe houses public but we literally walked the ground and saw those and so God's just kind of since 2019 showed us incredible work like Dottie's work, incredible work like uh, the U.S. Institute Against Human Trafficking and their boys' homes, incredible work like Created and some of these ministries locally. And that's how we feel about Oak Rock, that now God's just turned the page and allowed us to, to come in contact with your work, which is extraordinary. And so we thank God for you all and what you're doing around the world. Our five loaves and two fish seem pretty small uh, compared to the need. I mean, we're talking about millions of dollars in teams in all of those countries. And so we're humble in recognizing we can just do a little bit. But Christina, Giving Tuesday is coming up. And we're going to try to start there, even ahead of 2024, to just start opening up this conversation. Can you talk a little bit about our hope for Giving Tuesday and then coffee through the end of the year? Yes. Yeah, so thanks so much, Oak Rock. We really appreciate everything. And it never, um, to Zach's point, like, I just feel like a very small part, but it, it's always such a refresher to know that there are people out there that are willing to risk their, their livelihood to, to like Oak Rock said, to really get the bad guy, you know, that is really what it's all about. And then on the additional component is to be able to share the gospel with those survivors and those that were rescued. So, um, thank you for all that you're doing. And as far as Giving Tuesday goes, I think that's really the kickoff for the next fiscal year and going into 2024 is, you know, I think listening to all this, it is very overwhelming. It's like, well, you know, I'm probably not going to go overseas and, and see this firsthand, but what can I do? And I think it just goes back to like, if everybody just does a little bit, it adds up to a lot. And like we talked about earlier, just changing that one habit, that one daily habit of drinking your coffee and starting with Giving Tuesday, I think we have a goal of five thousand mm -hmm. dollars to raise yep. so i mean it's a, it's a drop in the bucket but that can very quickly snowball because i think if you know that you're doing good you want to share especially you know there's 
pros and cons to the internet. We all just learned, um, and I'm sure we all know, but it, it's very quickly, you can just take a snapshot of you drinking your coffee and know that every morning that you have it, that you are making an impact and it's going to be able, a way to pay it forward. And then every single month you can do that. You know, Christmas is coming up. Giving Tuesday is also a great time to stock up on multiple bags and give them to your friends and family to say thank you, but also ways of awareness. I really think that's where a lot of people it's a good place to start is just knowing, like I knew a little bit about what was going on, but I've learned so much. I didn't know that human trafficking was such a broad spectrum and it was happening, you know, everywhere. And I think we can just literally start a conversation over a cup of coffee, just like friends and just see where that conversation goes. And you never know who, you know, like two years ago, I didn't know you and look where we are today. And I think when God puts those little pieces in front of you, you just have to pick them up and see where, it takes you. And I think saying yes to a lot of things. So, you know, Buddy Brew is a great partner. Uh, we're very excited to be able to um, donate all the revenue. Same thing with the lab. It's 100%. Everything you donate goes right out the door. There's no administrative cost. So we're really excited to give 100% of those proceeds to Oak Rock Foundation so that they can continue the work that everybody learned about today. And I think just seeing it snowball and seeing it grow. And it's going to be really awesome to see, you know, this time next year, what, uh, what we all accomplished. Yeah. Yeah. It's so cool. I mean, I would have never imagined being able to say when we started the lab initiative, we just thought, let's bring what we have. And then it was over $50,000 that we were able to contribute. And so here we're sitting today ahead of giving Tuesday and ahead of the year end. And we literally don't know. I'll just tell one quick story. We had a gentleman that was a part of that $50,000 that we were able to give. He literally heard an episode on Lab the Podcast and heard us mention the Lab Initiative and was in a completely different state and felt convicted to cut a check for $5,000 to the Lab Initiative. And that might be you listening to the episode. I mean, you're sitting there and you go, what can I do? And I don't have the ability to go overseas. I don't have the ability to do these other things. But you know what? I can uh, give at this end of the year. I can participate. And so that's what the Lab Initiative is all about, is just bringing us together uh, with great partners like Oak Rock Foundation and great leadership like Christine is bringing to the initiative. And then all of us partners who can say yes in some way. So be watching for that on social media, the Giving Tuesday, the year-end asks that we're going to do. Just know now that the Lab Initiative is extending this partnership and we're excited about that. And this, I'll, I'll direct you first to buddybrew.com. Just go to Buddy Brew. It's Freedom Roast. That's the particular coffee. That one consumer choice. And so here's my ask. Share this episode. You don't know who in your network is preparing to uh, either give significantly financially and looking for a place to partner to do something incredibly impactful in the world. You don't know who might purchase a cup of coffee or just change that one consumer habit. So send the episode their way and then send them to buddybrew.com. Look for that freedom roast. And Oak Rock, I'll just ask you, as we think about um, not just those steps, but what we're praying for. Uh, I, we always say we're going to pray for Oak Rock. We didn't know you existed, a lot of people, before they listened to this episode, and now they do. And so I would say be praying and just pray for the, the people who are doing this work. Uh, what are the other ways that we can be a strong partner as the lab initiative, our little engine that could? How can we be a great partner for the work that you're doing? Well, you know, Zach, the prayer is really key. A prayer in our setting is a real prayer for, for protection. Uh, we have to remain stealth in the, because of how we operate in the places we operate in. We can't have pretty websites and all those things. We have to stay completely on, on that out of that, that space because... Um, because of the vastness of what we do and where we are. And so it's very, it's, we, we need that prayer coverage all the time. Um, we literally have to fight in areas. So, you know, that's, that's a big deal is prayer support, covering wisdom. And obviously you said it, you know, it, it, yeah, it, this is not a, 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 this is a millions of dollars. It's going to, you know, to, to create and do what we got to do and to be able to be effective in it. And the key with a foundation, starting a foundation, which we really finally just all came together, uh, the, the core guys that really had been underwriting everything and said, we've got to get people behind us that can help. And a foundation is the way to do it because we can get people that we can build a big foundation that can move these operations without ever having to think about money anymore. That's where we want to go. 
So you said it too. You don't know who's listening like the guy that was in another state. You don't know who's listening to this that's going, you know, they may have a foundation or they may have a lot of income that they want to make work for something that would go on beyond them, so to speak, make a real difference. And that's what a foundation allows us to do. It allows us to have that, that endowment type work that can keep on keeping teams out there. So there may be people that can write seven figure, eight figure checks. I mean, we don't know that, but that's, that, that's part of what it comes down to too, obviously is who can connect us. And that's the key. We're one, I tell people all the time, we're one handshake away from really transforming thousands of lives. And uh, that's where you guys come in too. Who's the, who, who do we know that you connect to? You know, people, yeah. people have family, they have friends, they have companies, they have all that. And that's just where we can sit down and say, let's talk, you know, let's just talk and see if this makes sense. And, and we're very open, as you know, to, to all of that, to, to talking, to meeting, to making sure people, um, you know, know who we are in that setting, in a private setting anyway, um, and can, uh, and, and, and can run with us, lock shields, you know, that's, that's what we're looking to do. Who can we lock? We're the tip of the spear. We know that, but who can we lock shields with and walk through this thing with together and, uh, and fight the fight. And we are in the stinking fight and we're going to stay in the fight because we're going to go, we're going, we are after the bad guy. I mean, and it, and, and if it's your next door neighbor, I'm sorry, we're after your next door neighbor. You know what I'm saying? We, we're going to, we are going to stop this stuff. We are going to take them down. And that's the mindset. And that's where we come from. So, you know, you yeah. guys are a big blessing. You're a huge blessing. And I, I thank you for your friendship. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking the time. I know even just the, it's a gift to, to have the time. It's a risk to open it up and have conversations like this. So we appreciate everything that your team is doing. And I would just echo what was just said from Oak Rock that our little part is going to be a prey. Uh, if every single person who listens to this episode prays and just says, you know what, I'm going to write down Oak Rock Foundation and I'm going to circle it. I'm going to pray for the work that's being done and for the people whose lives are being impacted. That's number one. Number two, share this episode and just keep the conversation going. As Christina said, pour a cup of coffee. Hopefully it's Freedom Rose from Buddy Brew, but pour a cup of coffee and just educate people in your sphere because there is that part that we have to get over that bias in us that wants to just say, it's too big, I'm going to shut it down. So share the episode, make those, make this a regular part of your prayer. And then third, I would just challenge you, bring what you have. We are looking to grow the lab initiative and be able to bring what we have as the lab initiative. But it, as you just heard from Oak Rock, you may hear this and you may have a family foundation that every year chooses an entity to partner with. And if we can help make that connection, just reach out and we'll make that connection directly. So you can participate with the lab initiative and just be a contributor to that. If you have a more significant uh, partnership that you're looking to create, then just let us be a catalyst. We can connect you with Oak Rock and the work they're doing. But Christina, thank you so much for giving your yes and for being our lab initiative director. You're going to hear much more from Christina in 2024. And Oak Rock Foundation, thank you so much. We'll be praying for you and bringing what we have, but we're grateful for you and your team. Uh, thank you, guys. You're a blessing.